Rucksack and rifle ruts with the best of them. Plus, in your face, fast food. We have a new competition to win a pair of Kite Optics binoculars and we reveal the winners of the Blazer Poplin shirt and the six bottles of Hadrian's Wool Slow Gin. To follow all that we have ferrets journeying to the centre of the earth, well pretty deep anyway, I'm out with the South Somerset ferreters. Plus we are shooting with the Royal Marines in Scotland, we have news, we have hunting YouTube, welcome to Field Sports Britain. We all love a good roar. Thankfully, Tim is not responsible for guiding us here what? in Portugal. What was wrong with that? That job falls to Field Sports Channel shareholder Sergio Couto and his partner Tiago, who want to dismiss the belief that Portugal is just about the Algarve. The interior of the country is, is, is very empty, which is good for the wildlife, yeah? and, and Portugal has a lot of game. We're here to hunt red stags and the rut. In early September they congregate here in what's become a vast 3,000 hectare eucalyptus plantation. The crop is for paper. The deer don't eat it, but they love it as it offers great cover and it comes with an early warning system. It's very crunchy under a Harkila boot. Traditionally, this is the only time the Portuguese would stalk deer. The Portuguese hunt in a different way than we do. I learned my, my stalking in, in the UK and, and you know, we use glass a lot. The Portuguese use the eyes and the ears. They just stop in here and if nothing is roaring, they go home early. So I kind of grab something of Tiago way of working and I mixed a little bit with mine and been working fine. We are going to use all our senses, boosted by some kite optics. Wow, we've been driving about an hour and we just arrived in the middle of this huge great place. It's a, it's a quite large eucalyptus plantation. And just look at it, it goes on for miles and miles and miles. But the most important thing is the red stags are roaring. We're here for the red stag in the middle of Portugal. and. Uh, the rut started about three weeks ago, but it's been so, so hot, it's actually kind of, they stopped for a while, but they started again. So it's really exciting, because we can hear, there's a two over there, there's two over there as well. So I think Sergio and, uh, and the guy there were just waiting to see what happened. And it's just a case of making a plan, so just getting everything ready. Got a thumbs up. The area is beautiful, even if coated in monoculture. So, there's two stags in that side. So in the bottom there is a dry riverbed, yes. which, because it dries a lot of stones, so it makes a lot less noise. Ah, oh, okay. So here yeah, it's like conflict, so we're going to try to go down to the riverbed and then walk on the rocks, try to get that in the bottom. We are hearing deer, 
but they are not full throttle. It means we end up getting too close and bumping them, losing track of their precise location between half-hearted roars. We bumped into a group of about eight or nine red deer. The problem is we were right in the sun so we couldn't see them. So they all, it is kind of sprung, but uh, Serge, he called and they all stopped. So we thought, right, there's a small, a smaller buck, a little spiker we call it, right in the back. Got the old sticks up, and, but it kept on moving. He rolled and it stopped. But we just couldn't get onto it, but the sun's right in our eyes, it's just hopeless. But they've just actually run across the valley. They've gone back over the top there somewhere, so we're just gonna see where about they go. But it's really great to see them, but the amount of ground they cover, you know, they're there, and suddenly within 30 seconds, they're 500 yards away. It's fascinating how they do it. So you can see where we can happen, see if we can move them around a bit, but it's, it's quite tough. What's happened is that, I don't know how, how um, warm it is now, but when we first got here, it was about 15 degrees. It's pretty near 25 now, perhaps. And as soon as the temperature rises, the, uh, the stacks stop roaring. So we, we listen to one over there, but they've all stopped roaring now, so we kind of, we've got to rely now on just getting on some high ground and glassing everything. But you probably gathered by the terrain. It's very, very brown on the base and green here. You can't actually see them. They, they're big beasts, but you can't see them. So, so we're not relying on the roar anymore, we're relying on our, our eyes. So it's a bit tricky. And also it's very, very hard stalking because it's so rocky, gravelly. The eucalyptus leaves fall off and it's crunch, 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 crunch. So it's, it's it's really tough stalking actually, so um, I think we're chasing shadows at the moment, but I think we've just got to get up high, glass, and see if we can find something. But that's handy for you, it's never straightforward. The first outing lasts four hours, and we cover a lot of ground without a chance of a shot. With the heat of the day rising, we call it, but then we hear a hearty roar, and a quick look turns into an exceptional hunt. It's down the back. We don't know where he is. Yeah. It's very hard. It's going to be very hard because it's very crumble. Yeah, yeah. So it's, so, so it's probably the opportunity to free if it's quite close. It's yeah. just yeah. straight onto it. Not yeah. The, you don't even. He's in the, other, he's in the yeah. other side. Yeah. On the other side. What do you mean? On the other side of the it's river? Still like 100 meters. 100 meters? It will be about 100 meters. But yeah, yeah, okay. Where are your boy? Right, Sergio. We've seen some beasts right up the other side of that gully. And we've been roaring here, and it's roaring back at us. And I think they're just moving up, aren't they? Yeah. They're in the gully because it's warm, it's um, a lot cooler, isn't it? That's right, yes. So yeah. what we've got to do now is we th we think they're over there somewhere to, where that's... He's down. He's, yeah. laying, he's laying flat. Laying down, laying okay. Down. So what we can do, we can go down. It looks quite, I don't see it on camera here, but we've got to go all the way down there. And there's a deer track, which goes on the right hand side of that shoulder. Now I think we'll probably tell them to stay on the top of that shoulder, shoulder and go straight down onto it. Yeah. Is that your plan? We hope, we hope that when we get high, the wind is really good, so make plenty of noise yes. to cover our noise. So we can try to get higher as, as we possible. As we get to the bend, we will stop there and we'll glass. Hopefully, you will not be far from it. Okay, right, yeah. He'll be laying down. Yeah. The trouble will be the calves because they keep moving. Yeah, okay. okay so yeah, yeah. We can only try. But yeah, okay. The wind is good. It's so a yeah, really strong wind, so. Yeah. so it's a really, it's a really good stalk, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, good, it's hard work. It's hard work. And then after we pull the trigger, we worry about taking them out. That's right. <laughs> okay, so so we go then. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll follow you then. I'm just going to use the track the deer use. Yeah, I don't know how you can get down there. You right, mate? <laughs> that was a good idea about half an hour ago. <laughs> anyway, you're only a youngster, so come on. <laughs> I 
Right, can you be truthful with me? Do you normally take your clients through things like this? Is it just us? You've just been feeling a bit of like evil streaking today. I'm rather glad I've got quite a um, hard-wearing rifle here. This, uh, this uh, Starman uh, SM12, it's doing actually really quite well. But you see all the scratches on it from the, because a lot of these bushes are real prickly, horrible, kind of thorny things anyway. So it's getting an absolute beating at the moment. So I'm quite glad that uh, we've got quite a sturdy, sturdy setup here, but uh, you know, I'm glad I haven't got a grade A bit of wood or wood uh, for this rifle because it would have destroyed it by now. Well, mate, we're nearly there anyway, so head up. Yes, the, the stag is still there. The stag is still there. Right, let's go. Okay, okay, okay. okay. All right. <laughs> well, Sergio. <laughs> well, sorry to make you look so hard. <laughs> that was bloody hard work, I must have it. Yeah. Oh my word. But the thing is, the thing is, all these things. You know, we got one over there. Yeah. I think there's one on the other side of the valley. But this yeah. one, it, it just seems far further away, doesn't it? Oh my word. There's suddenly the flipping things right. You know, it's 50 <laughs> yards in front of us. Hey, don't give me much chance, do you? Hey. Oh, oh, well done. That's, that was an epic stalk, you know. Oh. It really was. It was really good. Oh, Poor old David, he's, he's on his last legs. He never got no water. No, no, no frigging rucksack. We, rucksack, rucksack, rifle. rucksack's miles away. Where did you left them? Yeah, yeah. Where did you left them? It's, it's in the car. Oh. <laughs> it's about an hour and a half away. But oh. really, a tougher. I mean, we gave, nearly gave up twice because we had to go up that back that's ravine. Right, that's right. And we that's thought, right. oh, no, no, no. I thought, no, come on, we've got to keep on going. And we eventually yeah. made the top of there. And then, and then, of course, you saw, saw the back end of it. Oh, the back end of the hind. Yeah, and then we they heard them all. So that just spurred us on again. That's so what, you see, the, you see the, the height come to, to a good... Oh, it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The other There's our one over there. Okay, okay, see it through there? That's one she came down. Oh, that's a lovely stack, isn't it? What a stalk! Our red yeah, is in beautiful good. condition and the meat will be heading to Germany like so much game shot in southern Europe. Well done, well done mate. That was, that was really good. That, that's a tough old hunt, wasn't it? Oh, that is... <laughs> well done. Thank you! Mate, mate, camera. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Thank you. You're a good stalker, you're a good hunter. <laughs> So it's your, your hard work, you push the beast this way, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it. How's it go? No, no, no. no, no how's no. it go? <laughs> so that round, Tim, the 300 win mag. Well, that was a 300 win mag. Um, I was shooting with 150 grain Remington all... core lock ammunition. So it's quite a, quite a hard penetrating round. But 300 win mag, you know, that's pushing that, that um, bullet out about 3,200 feet a second. So you imagine the energy when it hits this beast at about 50, 60 yards. So it really knocks them hard. It's a, it's a great ram. I've got it actually zeroed at 200 meters. So at 250 meters, it drops three inches. 300 meters, it drops about six inches. So really out to 300 meters, it's pointed at your beast and it will go down. So it's a really effective round, very hard hitting. As you saw then, it just went just straight down. So, but, you know, it took it right on the front of the chest as well. But uh, yeah, it's a really, really capable caliber, very popular in Africa. Because it's, it's, it's kind of fast, flat calibre, um, fast shooting round. When you sell this to the butcher or to the local game dealer, you, you, you sign that you've actually checked all this, do you? Yes. That's good, yeah? 
you have to, you have to do a, a, a course, a two days course, yep. to, to learn about all the, the problems. Thanks so much, Paul. Very clever. Watch your back, team. Yeah, yeah. Good. If you look across over there, about half a mile away, there's some old ruins there. And that's where we started, and we actually dropped down into the ravine, up at one, uh, up to the top of that kind of uh, hill there, then down to that one, and all the way across up to here. So it's probably about, I suppose, three quarters of a mile, 28 to 30 degrees. It's thick as hell down through the bottom there, and a really tough hunt, but uh, it just gives you an idea of the terrain we're actually hunting through all those kind of eucaly eucalyptus trees and through the thick bush down the bottom there. And we're so lucky and fortuitous to actually end up on the track where we actually shot the beast. So it's just such an easy recovery. So a really good morning's work. I'm so hungry, I'm so thirsty, haven't drunk anything for about four hours. We need to get home and have a beer. Wait. Once cleaned, the stag carcass goes on the back of the truck and off to the chiller. The majority of locals don't care about a carcass being transported through the streets. It may be a different story in Lisbon, but not here in the centre of the country. While we process the meat, the gralic is being processed back on the hill. Griffin vultures are incredible birds and demolish the pluck in seconds. For more information about Steyr rifles, go to steyrmanlicker.com. For Harkila, visit harkila.com. For Kite Optics, take a look at kiteoptics.com. And if you want to hunt with Sergio and Tiago in Scotland or Portugal, go to circoutwildharvest.com. Thank you, Tim, Sergio and Tiago. Definitely contenders for the Bolving World Championships there. And if you want to see the whole of that vulture feast, we've uploaded it to YouTube. Click on the eye symbol top right. Now, joining Harkila Clothing and Steyr Manica as sponsors of Tim Pilbeam's Rucksack and Rifle series is Kite Optics. And we have got a pair of Kite Petrol Binoculars 10x42s worth more than £500 to give away. You could win them. All you have to do is write Kite Optics Petrol in the comments below and we'll draw the winner in a few weeks' time. Now from Precision Optics to, well, Mr Magoo, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. Antis are using credulous news journalists to shame people who go hunting and shooting. The Daily Telegraph outed FTSE 100 boss Mark Bristow, head of a mining company, after he'd been on hunting trips in South Africa. Meanwhile, Hounds Off is among groups using the independent newspaper to criticise the chairman of the Kent Wildlife Trust, Michael Bax, who served as huntsman and joint master of a pack of beagles, as well as allowing pheasant shooting on his farm. This picture shows Hounds Off founder Joe Hashman demonstrating outside the Kent Wildlife Trust AGM, with some people dressed as ducks. The New Zealand hunting lobby has won concessions over the government's proposed tar cull. Minister of Conservation Eugenie Sage has pulled back from plans to cull 10,000 Himalayan tar on public land in South Island. She now says her department is still finalising the plan and the 10,000 target is adaptable. The hunters are prepared to go to court to fight the government and the Department of Conservation, and 33,000 of them raised $156,000 through Give a Little to Pay for Lawyers. Thanks to Graham Steens for keeping us up to date with this. Shooters are coming together to mark the anniversary of the end of the First World War. Cornish countryman Chris Green and newly appointed Basque wildfowling officer Shane Robinson, lovely chap, went to school with him, are joining John Cavana, Richard Walton and falconer Tory Goodall to walk 100 kilometres in three days on October's frontline walk to raise money for the Army Benevolent Fund. Chris is planning to walk in his waders carrying a bag of decoys. Visit bit.ly forward slash 1918 walk to support them. A YouTube goose calling star has died in an ATV crash. 
Tim Grounds, whose goose and duck calls are sold at sporting goods stores across the USA, died in an ATV crash near his home in Illinois. He was spraying weeds from it when it rolled over. Following controversy in the USA, the Dallas Safari Club has released a film defending a black rhino hunt. In it, DSC director Corey Mason explains how the rhino was a danger to its herd and how the money from the hunt helped protect other rhinos. One of the biggest hunting success stories in the world is bringing in cash to the local community. According to recent figures, the local government distributed 80% of the money it received from the trophy hunting programme in 2017 and 2018. The rest of the money supported local wildlife conservation communities and paid to control illegal hunting in the region. Markor permits cost around £600 each. And finally, a university student in the UK has taken what he describes as a one in a million wildlife photograph. Oban van Shee took the snap of the white fallow buck sneezing at Bradgate Park in Leicestershire while out on his motorbike. He didn't realise he had the shot until he started editing his photographs. It's since gone viral on Instagram. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Coming up, we've got the Royal Marines, we've got ferrets, we have got the winners of the Blazer Poplin shirt and the Hadrian's Wall Slow Gin. First of all, a message from the British Association for Shooting and Conservation. Thank you for that. Now, last week I mentioned we are helping out with a hunt clothing survey. And if you take part, you could enter a draw to win a Garmin Phoenix 5 watch, actually rather a lot more than a watch, worth more than £600. So go to bit.ly slash hunt clothing to do that. 300 of you have done it so far. Our target is 1,000. If you possibly could, would be very helpful. Thank you. Now, some parts of the country say they haven't got very many rabbits. Well, my part of Somerset is teeming with them, apparently. That is what is supposed to happen, filmed by the South Somerset ferreters in a different part of Somerset to where we are today. You put the nets over the holes, the ferrets into the holes, the rabbits come bolting out. Where we are today, there is no shortage of rabbits. There's no shortage of sign of rabbits. But right now, there's something wrong. And if you are a world-class ferreter, you may have spotted it already. Um, we're in another sunny summer part of Somerset. Um, a nice little valley. It's not just sunny, it's funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can't you keep your men under control? I don't know what they're doing down there. Uh, <laughs> we'll find it. They've obviously found yeah, something. Yeah, something's highly amusing. Uh, they're going to tell us all about it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Lady's got horses here, and the problem she's having the horses are the rabbits are digging holes out in the field. Of course, causes a big problem for the horses. You know, risk of injury and all that. But the last thing you want is a horse's foot going down the hole. But now we're going to sort of try and do the lady a favour, really. Good. Get rid of the rabbits. Um, well, you've got, you've got a very you've got a very interested audience there. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I mean. These horses cost a lot of money, I guess, don't they? I imagine. Yeah. 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 These South Somerset ferreters are certainly county-class ferreters, maybe even national. Here they are on this lovely sloping field on the edge of the rich red soil of the Vale of Taunton Dean in Somerset. They put out the nets, they deploy the ferrets, they wait, and they wait. But no rabbits. At the moment, the problem remains unsolvable. Now let's talk tech. It's like an endoscope, really. There's always a hole that needs inspecting, Charlie. Um, but yeah, I've got this little NPR alert. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to connect that to this, and then we can um, record, hopefully, what's going on underground, as well as above ground. Right. Uh, well, yeah, you know, yeah. normally get the footage underground. So. And it's got a light on it. Yeah, it's got a light on the end. Look, if I turn it on and put the light on. It's great, I mean, 
brilliant. We'll give it a go. If it don't work, it don't work. Exactly. If it works, you know, brilliant. But Master of invention. You yeah, are. I've been playing at home in the dark, you know, seeing things I don't normally see at home in the dark. But <laughs> I think we should leave it yeah, there. Yeah, we'll leave that one there, shall we? <laughs> yeah. Next, let's talk about dogs, because they play an integral part in this story. You've got um, the highly trained South Somerset uh, Barrington dogs here as well. Yeah. And a few others. And a few others, yeah, as normal. Oh, I apologise. <laughs> that's all right, others. yeah, that's all right. It wouldn't be the same, Charlie, without your dogs, really. Yeah. <laughs> Good, so anything you see that's highly trained and efficient is yours, is it? Who says mine's highly efficient and trained, you know? <laughs> yeah. The South Somerset ferreters bring their own dogs, ranging from Whippet to Bull Lurcher. Fast, fun-loving and fierce. You wouldn't want to be a bolting rabbit with this lot around. I bring my Cocker Spaniels, obviously highly trained. I also bring my daughter's Ickle Pretty Cavachon, which is London for mongrel. And as you can see, it appears to be vegetarian. And my neighbour brings his Terrier. Last time we were out, we showed how to introduce a dog to ferrets. Dogs have long memories for nips and bites and my dogs keep a respectful distance from the ferrets. We move slowly down the hedge and at last some action. A ferret chases a young rabbit out into the open and catches it in the purse net. That's not a good sign, the young one. Probably eight weeks old I suppose. Yeah, no more than that. No. So that one was in the wrong place at the wrong time right? Really. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Further down the hedge, there's another commotion, only this time something's wrong. It's not a rabbit that squeaks. The terrier, which has not been ferreting before, is having a go at a ferret. The nearest people dive onto the dog and drag it off. Is that the one? No. It's put on a lead in disgrace. The ferret disappears underground to lick its wounds. Now we are all gathered on the same spot in the hedge, and the ferret is down in the berry. We use ferret finders to locate it. Um, basically, the search gives you a wider area, sort of general searching, um, just to give you a rough idea of where the ferret is. And once you've got a reading on search, flip it to locate, and that gives you a pinpoint sort of area where it is, you know. So at the moment we're getting search reading, we're not getting a locate. Yeah, can not get nothing on locate. Um, getting a good reading on search. When you say it gives you a pinpoint reading, like um, it says exactly how many people. Exactly, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty accurate between sort of six inches, really. Um, if it says two foot, you can guarantee you dig down sort of one and a half or two foot and you'll find your ferret. First of all, the ferret doesn't move and everyone is nervous. Has the dog damaged the ferret? Has the dog killed the ferret? Jaff thinks the dog may have damaged the ferret's collar. Next, we notice it is off the clock for depth, more than 16 feet, which is the maximum the ferret finders can locate. After a while, the ferret starts moving, climbing back up to the surface, and everyone sighs their relief. Yeah, he's definitely moving. Just wanted to come back up. So we found, I mean, because that ferret's been going so deep, we discovered this is at least 16 feet deep. Does plus, that, yeah. Does yeah. That, do those ferret finders work deeper than that? No, well, it, 16 plus, I mean, but it won't really pick up anything past 16 foot, not really. The movement of the ferret also shows that the ferret finder readings are accurate. At 100 yards long and a minimum 16 feet deep, this is an underground rabbit city. You could pour ferrets into this berry and still have them chasing rabbits round and round in circles. It's the red sandy soil. It's so easy to dig that over the years, that's exactly what the rabbits have done. They have dug. Now it only remains to tempt the ferret to the surface and see how injured it is. The endoscope proves invaluable. You can see the ferret's eyes in this shot. Eventually it gives Jaff an accurate location and he's able to give it a visual check for injuries. After digging around it and tempting it out with that rabbit, Jaff eventually reaches in and hauls it out. Two small puncture wounds, but it's looking healthy and we return it to the box for R and R. Plus we have solved the puzzle. Some berries are too big to ferret. The fact that ferret finders go to 16 feet, I mean, is, is that, that's kind of too deep for ferreting, really, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> definitely, yeah. I mean, is there, is, there any, is there any ferreting strategy for a, for a bank that's more than 16 feet deep? Could you flood it with ferrets? Uh, well, I don't know, really, Charlie. I mean, if it's that deep, yeah. who knows what goes on under there? I mean, yeah. it could be an absolute honeycomb under there. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's where the uninvented ferret cam would come in handy but until someone invents a decent ferret cam but it ain't gonna happen I don't think so it remains a mystery I'm afraid. 
Well, if anyone's going to invent the ferret cam, it's going to be the South Somerset Ferreters. For more about them, click on the i symbol top right to visit their YouTube page or search South Somerset Ferreters official group on Facebook. Bad luck, South Somerset Ferreters. Better luck next time. Now let's draw the Blaser Poplin shirt, which is a competition we ran in August. As usual, I put all your entries into my phone on a spreadsheet. So I'm going to scroll down and scroll up, and I'm going to choose a winner completely at random by clicking on it. And the one that's highlighted is Brian Miles. Brian Miles puts in Blaser Poplin Classic Shirt XL, even gives us a size, and he ended on YouTube. Well, Brian, we'll be posting one of those out to you. Now let's go shooting with the Royal Marines. What does a bad and clay shooting have in common? A Royal Marines charity shoot is what. We are at Dunkeld in Perthshire to raise money for a services charity. I am uh, Hayden White, uh, I'm Brigadier in the Royal Marines. I'm the Deputy Commandant General. I'm also the Vice Chair of the Royal Marines Charity. So this is a charity clay pigeon shoot. Uh, which we now call the Royal Marines Commando Clay Pigeon Shoot, which has been held in Scotland for the last four years. Um, and it raises money towards the Royal Marines Charity, which benefit, uh, benefits uh, some over a thousand families um, each year. Uh, and so this is a really good opportunity for us to interact with the people of Scotland that enjoy their clay pigeon shooting, show off some of our young Marines who've been part of the teams today, uh, and a wonderful day all in all, which we hope will make uh, raise some money to a very good cause. This is our favourite charity uh, for Browning and for international sports brands who distribute Browning in the UK. Uh, we received a call from Colonel Barry Barnwell about five years ago now, four years ago, uh, saying, look, we're trying to do, raise some money for the, the wounded of, of the Royal Marines, and we'd very much like you to come and join us because of the Browning connection with the military and you know we get lots and lots of requests every year for, for, for charity events but it really struck a chord with us and uh, we're very proud to support the charity now it's our fourth year as a headline sponsor it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more interesting and fun and you can see today it's a great atmosphere and we're very proud to support it. So there's five flush sequences. Um, they've got the, the grouse that's here, the partridge, pheasant, um, and then there's a couple of rabbits thrown in on one of them. So you're doing 50 birds, uh, 50 bird flush with a four man gun. Um, so uh, yeah, they're just randomly throwing the flushes out and hit, hit as many as you possibly can and someone's counting the misses. Um, and then at the end of the day, they'll tally up all the scores the uh, top five teams will go into a shoot-off on one of the flushes to win, uh, to, to win overall flush high, high team, really. <laughs> yeah. The great thing about it, we've got some professional shooters here which take it very seriously. We've got people that have never shot before and we, what we do is we parachute a marine, a serving marine into each team uh, to help, help with the day as well and it just brings a great atmosphere and uh, it's all fun and everyone helps each other. Clearly in Scotland, uh, field sports uh, are very popular. Um, in many respects, those that conduct such sports are quite like-minded, have an affinity with the armed forces. And I think this is a good way to showcase those, th th those talents, both in the armed forces and in the civilian population. The support we give through the Clays, being the Clay Pigeon Company, um, is, is brilliant for the guys. It gets them to keep the costs down. Um, but it's also good just for supplying everything to everybody really. Um, we supply all the traps to the, the ground as well, um, so it's for all the port here. Um, it's just nice to, to be involved and be able to give something back by you know, sponsoring the, the clays for the event for them. So the top five teams are team number 15, near miss, team number 11, hardy hitters, team 22, House of Brewer Max and team number seven, John Clark BMW Dundee and team 18, Rat Pack. The event now has developed into something which is all embracing in terms of Royal Marines core family and the values thereof. 
uh, and we are encouraged by the fact that most of our main sponsors are also family companies uh, and we enjoy having their company here. Certainly we're here to make money, it's about fundraising for the Royal Marines charity but it has gone way beyond that now, it is now something of an outreach, uh, it's something of a, a notice of inclusivity amongst all of the family, our family and our extended friends and family. So yes, it's important for us to raise money uh, so that we can actively support throughout their entire lives young recruits, serving Marines, reserve Marines, retired Marines, wounded Marines and bereaved families and other needs amongst that family. But it's equally important for our Royal Marines to have an association with their civilian uh, community. For more about this shoot visit rmacharityshoot.com A glorious day and for the record the winner is John Clark BMW Dundee so well done to them. Now from Perthshire to Northumberland where they make this stuff, Hadrian's Wall Gin. And you probably noticed I've been trying to tempt you to their website for the last couple of weeks, bit.ly slash gin offer, because we've negotiated a super discount. That is free delivery for your gin anywhere in the UK. All you have to do is go to bit.ly slash gin offer and pop the code FSTV01 into the website and that offer will take place. Now, I know there were some teething problems early on with the website. If you went there, if you wanted gin, you couldn't get gin and you still want gin, please go back there, bit.ly slash gin offer, FSTV01. Plus, wait a moment while I put my bottle down. We are offering six bottles, a case of Hadrian's Wall Gin to one lucky winner. Lots and lots of you have entered and once again, you're all on my phone here. So to choose a winner, I'm going to scroll down. Quite a lot more of you entered this than entered the Blazer Poplin shirt drawer. So you're obviously gin drinkers, not shirt wearers. And the winner is Facebook, Chris Denison. Win gin. Well done, Chris Denison. We'll be in touch with you for your address. Now from Roman Ramparts to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. The My Yorkshire Hawks channel puts together a film from at least three cameras mounted on its Ostringers, which gives a fascinating insight into their hawking methods. Continuing with the theme of sport and the season of mellow fruitfulness, Hunting Moments in September by Hunting Fever shows scenes that will strike a chord with country people across Europe. Hesham Khan puts up a highlights film of quail shooting in his native Pakistan. That country is on my bucket list. Point of Impact TV takes a Hauer 1500 varmint GRS into a for Ruger and Yukon Photon RT 6x50 out after foxes. On the Red Moose Hunting Channel in Sweden, Oliver Arberg is hunting wild boar at night, filmed by a thermal imaging camera. Outdoor Limits is public land teal shooting in Kansas. He over a bit, calling it the craziest duck hunt of his life, but it is certainly a good morning shoot. If you are into bow hunting whitetail deer, the Hunting Public Channel's Deer Tour is now on episode 14, putting out a half hour episode every couple of days. This is from episode 2. And finally, the forest around Suprashal in Poland are full of big red stars and in this film translated into Russian by Huntman, you get an idea about what they are like, especially if you speak Russian. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the I symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link, charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that is it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please pop over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click to like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. You can follow us on Twitter. And you can even pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you by email about this show. Field Sports Britain is at 7pm UK time every Wednesday. Plus, you can buy shares in Field Sports Channel. Go to fieldsportschannel.tv slash shares to find out more about that. It only remains for me to say, good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye.